for a really long time i mean like cry and believe are like quite up there for me like oh man like r- really like compositionally i mean you're, you're an amazing drummer of course but like especially compositionally i love what you did and uh but i want to start start in the present or maybe future because this one hasn't been like you said released officially kind of or it is stretch woven you sent me this one with nels and it's wow you <laughs> it's, it's 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 like uh, you you know the third song. What, what's the name of the third song? Uh, oh man, I, I can't I, even tell you. I can't remember. <laughs> just something like anyway. It starts like with you having this like broken drum beat, and it's probably also you doing some electronics. I don't know in that duo because who's doing stuff? You know. I, well, you hear Nels playing guitar, but. Uh, then it's just like, and I wanted but to ask, you, yeah, how, how did, yeah, how did you guys do this project? I mean, when was this done and how behind it? Well, I think we recorded it three years ago now. Time is just so Already? elusive, it's oh, hard okay. to tell, but we didn't release it. We recorded it, um, well, what happened was, you know, Nels and I have been playing music together since the mid-90s, and... Um, yeah. And, you know, I play in his band. He played in my band. I play in his band. We've yeah. done a whole bunch of different projects and blah, blah, blah. And there was there's a promoter in, um, in Edmonton, Canada, who was wanting me to come up. And he wanted, he asked to do a duo with me and Nels. Seriously? Oh. And so I, so I broached this idea with Nels and he was into it. And we were, we were in Japan with my band, actually. It's kind of oh, uh, really? kind of slide in and there. We were in Japan with my band and we had lunch and we discussed the possibility of making, doing a recording. We're like, well, if we're going to do a duo, let's make a recording. So, so I flew out to New York the following September. Um, and, uh, we spent a couple days with our good friend Eli Cruz mm-hmm. at Figure Eight. And he had this idea. The initial idea was to make a 45 with, uh, <laughs> you know, like two singles, like, you know, an a, a side yeah. A and side B, which are short, and then release the rest of the record as a download. So we, like, kind of constructed these two short pieces, and then we just improvised. And, um, you know, we have this really wide vocabulary to get together so anything's possible and also we see the studio and see we see music as like anything's possible so yeah. so it was it's it was really fun and easy and um uh we just we left with you know this whole record of music and then what nels realized about the this the whole vinyl little 45 thing was that whenever wilco releases a record um and they have a download code. No one, da- no one ever downloads anything. It's like ah, yeah. the management's like no one. So we decided to put it on CD and um, and the whole record and um, and then sort of things got shaken up in the Wilco world in terms of management. And we did a little West Coast tour and we just sold the CD and and um, we've just been unsure because he's been busy and I've yeah. been kind of busy about like. How to how to officially release it, even though you can buy it, and we like the idea that it's this sort of like little hidden underground little gem. It is. That if you know yeah. about it, you can find it. And we're also hoping that no one puts it on YouTube, so that like yeah. people will just buy the CD. But you know, yeah, you can't totally control that. But but anyway, um, so this promoter in Canada, you know, he was the one that sort of, you know, uh, instigated the whole idea, and and. We've just got this long history of playing together, so... Um, and you did that gig then in Edmonton, or...? We did the gig in Edmonton, and then and then I booked a little West Coast tour from, like, oh, okay. um, you know, in, in, like, June of that same year. And, yeah. And, um, 
But yeah. how, 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 much, how much of this record is like improvised and how much was like sketched out? I mean, uh, I, I guess it's not really composed, composed in a sense because it's a duo, but like you, you can see that, you know, you go from improvised into a like kind of like a composed groove or and then you again move somewhere else. Like how, how did you guys agree on the sketches or the tunes or? Well, the first two pieces of the record, those um, are were kind of concepts Nels had and we kind of put together and mm -hmm. we kind of made because, you know, when you when initially when you're thinking about a 45, you have a you know, specific amount of time. Yeah. So so he had these ideas and, and we sort of ran them together and then we did some layering and stuff. And then after that, we just decided to we each had sort of like, well, let me try this. Let me start with this. I'll do that. Oh, okay. And we just improvised and um um and then we just sort of went through went afterwards we went through and just decided what we liked and we did a little bit of editing, you know, mm -hmm. um, but you know, I mean, I've been playing with him for so long and to me, it's really an honor to play with him. And he's like one of my closest friends, but, but Nels is just, you know, to me, he's yeah, like, he's, like the yeah. John Coltrane of our era. You know what I mean? He's oh, just, that's an, yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm always grateful to have that time when we get to play yeah. together. I, I love his playing. I mean, like, you know, most people know him like Wilco, of course. Like, but I, I even teach students, like, you know, all those songs, like the Impossible Germany solo. I, that's on the to learn list of my students and stuff. And and uh, but you know, then then the the stuff, you know, the singers, people should know more about it. Even the, before, you know, he became famous, and it's really good, you know, and. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, like you mentioned, uh, where did you guys meet? Like in the beginning, you said '90s. Like how how was that, how did that happen? Well, Nels had a series of really a, a famous uh, series in LA, infamous, I guess, or whatever underground series at a club called the Alligator Lounge called New Music Monday. Oh. And a dear friend of mine, Philip Greenleaf, who I've been oh, yeah. playing with since then, um, and Nels are old friends, and we were. Philip and I have a duo, and we have a trio with Trevor Dunn also. But um, so Philip's like, "Hey, let's go to LA and play at my friend Nels's uh, little music series." And yeah. and he and I was at his house, and he played me some music of Nels's, and I was like, "Whoa, this is amazing!" So yeah. we went down and we played. And the deal with the New Music Monday was that Nels would have like two bands. I don't know if they were all from out of town, but often out of town bands. And then his trio would play the last set. Mm -hmm. And often he would sit in with people and, you know, you'd collaborate. Oh, wow. That's beautiful. So, um, so we got to meet, we heard each other and we ended up playing together and it was just like, Oh my God, you know, who is this guy? Yeah. So, so, um, so that was the way we met. And then um, <coughs> further, further down the road, G.E. Stinson was doing the booking for Nels when he was like on the road with Mike Watt or something. And, and then he had this gig and, and somehow like it came up that I should come to LA to play with them. So, so I went and I played with G Nels and G.E. and Stuart Liebig. And then we started stink bug, which became L stink bug because there's like a death metal band called stink bug in Texas. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> um, and, and then from there we just would play occasionally and we were in touch and, and then I was on, on this tour in Europe and I was just thinking about things and I wrote him an email saying, hey man, I'd really love to play with you playing your music. And his trio had dissolved and he wrote me back saying, funny thing, I was thinking the same thing. Oh, wow. So I got back from this tour and we talked and then like we just started, he started the singers like soon after that. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, but immediately when you started, like uh, when, when you joined the singers, right? The, you didn't use so much electronics in the beginnings, right? What, what, when no. did this happen? Like, <clears throat> did you start using this through the singers? Because also, like with Charlie and uh, Hunter and TJ Kirk, it's you know more groove oriented. But like here, you can really get off the leash in a way, which is amazing, you know. So thank you, thank you. Well, what happened was um, before I met Nels, I was uh, working with this Kodo player named Mia Masaoka, uh -huh. and. Um, one day I was at her house and we were rehearsing and she had a little mixing board and a bunch of pedals on her Kodo. And I was like, wow. I was like, huh? And I was like, you know, I want to do that with drums. And she's just like, be careful. Cause it's going to cost <laughs> a lot of money and a lot of frustration. <laughs> so, 
So, you know, the idea, and back then in the 90s, like, you know, do you remember when, like, drum and bass and jungle and all this yeah, electronic yeah, sure, stuff yeah. happened? Yeah. What I loved about it was, some of it was sonically what was happening and how it was sort of like, we were taking, we were taking sounds like drums, really particularly drums, and mangling them and changing them around and and we had drum machines and stuff but mm. but but then I but then I heard people like Nels and um and a couple other guitar players doing things to their guitars and I was like man I want to do that to drums so so I started I started like you know putting this thing together in my basement and trying different things and and I was doing it for a while and and you know both with like a lot of frustration as Mia had sort of yeah. <laughs> preemptively told me um and then but then it sort of was getting somewhere and then one day Nels was at my house and I was like man check this out so he comes downstairs and and I've been telling him about it okay so he's <laughs> I'm like check this out and he's like dude bring that on the gig and I was like really and he's like yeah so he kind of he was the one that really pulled it out and brought it on the stage and and you know it, it's take it took a while to to really get it to a the place idea, where, yeah. you know, it was an extension of what I was doing. That you can but, control it, actually, right? And Yeah. Yeah. Um, because, you know, lot, there's there's two sides to it. One is, you know, you're, when you're when I'm live, I have this little clip mic I use and and an amplifier. And um, and then in the studio, I'm just having the engineer send a, a mix, to, a mix yeah. of the drums, which is great. In the studio, it's like... It's easy. E easier, it's, yeah. You know, more expressive. But, um, yeah. but it's be become a, a thing that... I've, you know, it's become a, a part of my sound now. And, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's like, it's like basically on triggers, like on clip mics, and then it goes into effects, and that kind of creates the, that's the the basic idea, right? Well, at first I had a couple mics, and then I forgot one mic at a gig once. So I just had this one little clip mic, this little, um, like, condenser mic, and, and I realized that that worked fine. So live, I only use this one little mic because, oh. because... I've come to learn how to deal with like, you know, input signal and, and gain and all that st stuff. And, and also I can move it around. So depending on what oh, I want to okay. do, that's good. Yeah. Be you know, um, because the whole idea is capturing sound and there's always, yeah. there's lots of happy accidents. Like sometimes I'll capture other people and sometimes yeah. what I'll do oh, is yeah, like, like Larry Oaks from the Rova saxophone quartet wrote a piece for me once where part of the piece, the band would come and encircle me and then I would sample them, and and then I would just be making weird sounds with with oh, stuff, wow. you know. Great. So it's and he would write for it, Nels would write for it, you know. Um, so it's it's this thing that like, because if you use like little contact mics, you're kind of a little like limited, and that's I mean, there's amazing. I mean, look, there's so many amazing things happening with electronic yeah, yeah. drums yeah. now. Um, but my thing, the way that I've been doing it. And you know, a constant, constant research and obsession with like pedals and stuff. You know, like do, um, do you buy like guitar pedals then, or like yeah, primarily, like, right? Yeah, yeah, guitar pedals. Um, yeah, because the thing about guitar pedals is there's this whole tactile thing to them, yeah. and um, uh, I've tried like I haven't. I for a little while was like exploring using an iPad and some stuff like that, and like that sample. There's a, a sampler. Mm -hmm. patch or uh, app that um and it, i think it could be cool but i like knobs and switches and it's nice stuff. to do it yeah it's unpredictable i like I like that also on a delay paddle you know you press something and it's like and yeah, it creates right. like you know playing like an 11 8 rhythm suddenly from a delay and it's like wow that's cool man <laughs> and the drummer you know goes with you or whatever yeah exactly yeah yeah i, I love this stuff yeah but the, 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 the then Nels, when he started writing stuff for the singers, is he aware then of that? Like, I mean, does he put that into his composition when he's writing? Also, saying like, okay, Scott will use now stuff here or yes, definitely. Like, right? there's there's some pieces where he he's kind of like got very specific ideas that he's wants me to try to figure out, and oh, okay. Um, sometimes he'll come across a pedal. I can remember where this one record we were making, and he's like, "You got to get this pedal because I want you to do this one specific thing." Oh. <laughs> so I got this pedal, and it was sort of part of this one piece, um, and it was cool, and it was a little tricky to get it to work. But um, but then he'll um, 
you know, then he'll just have some ideas, like just sound ideas that um, he'll want me to do. And then like, the, you know, there's a new singers record coming out and this new record um, called Share the Wealth, which is coming out November 13th. Oh, okay. oh well, I'll have to check it out. When we were doing it, um, there were a couple places he wanted some specific things. And then we were just jamming at times, which ended up being on this record. There's a, there's a few pieces where we're just improvising and I would come up with some loops um, and, uh, and, you know, they become a, a big part of what these pieces ended up being. And, yeah. um, so oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. you know, it's, it's become a part of my vocabulary and I've also like learned, you know, that each pedal, I mean, there was a, you know, there's various revelations when you're dealing with your instrument, you know, and yeah, yeah. With, with, with pedals, like each pedal is an instrument in the universe into itself, yeah. you know, and some have like a lot of things they can do and some have little things they can do, but um, cause um, G Stinson and I were once talking about year, like uh, several years ago, we're like, man, I spent two hours practicing in my studio, which was just twiddling knobs and switches. <laughs> and it's just like, you know, you got to put the time in with that stuff if you yeah. want it like anything, you know, it's, it can be dangerous. Yeah. If fact, yeah. It can be like, really like, but one, one really big gig I had was, uh, like, you know, a gig where I felt like I'd really arrived at a musical place was. I was playing up at the Vancouver Jazz Festival with Paul Plimley and um, Mark Holias. Oh, and really? while I'm, yeah, and Paul knows what I do, and Paul, it was Paul's gig, and Mark shows up, and I'm setting up, and my pedal board's a little bit big at this point, and and I'm setting it up, and Mark walks, and he looks at me. I like, already see Mark though. <laughs> you know, he's like, uh, "What's going on with that?" and the the biggest revelation I had at recently, like I'd say about three or four months before that gig, maybe even longer, was using a volume pedal. And once I started using a volume pedal, I could get really musical with it. You know, oh, you have a volume pedal. I didn't know yeah, that. Wow. that's a really important part of it because when I'm playing and if I have something going, I could just not like it's to the right of my hi hat, so I can just shut the volume off immediately. Oh, and and actually, little. A side note is Glenn Taylor makes these pedals called Rolo pedals, which are so small and robust, and it's great because it fits perfectly next to my yeah. hi-hat. I'll check so, your uh, hi-hat. Oh, cool. Yeah, good. it's great. So, so I said, Mark, look, man, here's the deal. This is just another thing that I do. I have an amplifier here. You don't have to put it in the monitors, and I'll use it if I feel like musically there's a moment to do it, but it's like I might not use it all night, but I promise it's not going to dominate the, the gig. Because, like, you know, I was on a gig once and Jeff Parker was like, man, you got to have your sound coming from your space. So then I started using a speaker near me and not just the monitors, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, so so they, we play the gig and after the gig, Mark's like, man, that shit was amazing. So, like, that was, you know, a real a big moment for me. Just like, breaker. Like, yeah. you know, that I've just, like, really got to a place where I could do it. And have it be really subtle. But then also, like anything, when you're playing music, sometimes you yourself needs to are dominating the musical space. Yeah. So I could do that with that as well, but also be musical with it and not. That's have it really be, important. Yeah. You know. Yeah, to be musical. I think electronics can be sometimes really like you know, just dominating actually the interplay and the uh, impro, and which is not the case with you. I mean. The, which is great that you actually know what you're doing with the tweaks and knobs, you know, <laughs> that, that's, that's a good thing. I, I mean, I but, like you, but like you said earlier, sometimes there's surprises. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I, I love that as well. Like with a delay, it's always something like, you know, it happens like, wow, that's an interesting thing. Or, you know, I, I love that. I love that. Uh, <laughs> but you, you mentioned Jeff Parker, uh, uh, which kind of leads, leads me to one, one, one really main question for you is like, since I, I mentioned at the beginning, I really love how you write music. And I, I wanted to ask you how you basically write music. Like, you know, do you start with a groove? Like, I don't know, that tune Oladipo, which has like this awesome uh, groove. Did you start, for instance, that song with the groove? Or or how, how do you write music, you know? Do you know that Nels and Jeff are in the band and the Jenny is in the band? And like, I just want to think, see your process of... Sure, sure. I walk around, like for years oh, since I started writing music, you know, there's been a different device that I walk around with to capture ideas in my head that I'll sing into, whether it was like a mini disc player or a Walkman or my, now it's just a phone, right? Because our phones, yeah. we can do that. So often 
like I'll get some idea in my head, some kind of musical idea. It sometimes it's like a like a little melodic part or a bass line, or sometimes it's actually an entire <laughs> piece of music, like a, you know, like a whole song. Yeah. I'm like the oh. song Diana Maria that's on my first record. That whole song came to me, or this other song. Like you sang it and the whole melody then you wrote, you know, wrote it out. And I was like, oh, and then I just, you know, transcribed oh, it. Wow. I mean, I'm not very good at playing piano or guitar, but those are the things I write on. But, you know, like Ola Depot, um, I think the way that, that that started was with um, the bass line. And, mm -hmm. and then um, I'm a huge fan of Tony Allen. You know, oh, really? Tony. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Tony Allen is one of my favorite musicians besides being but probably one of my top five favorite drummers you know drummers, yeah. oh, wow. um you know because tony the way that tony plays tony changed drumming and like it's so unique and what i love about tony when we're talking about groove is how he took the groove and he made it so that we can do these really interesting rhythms within a groove and um that to me was very liberating you know him and zigaboo are, yeah, are the meters right yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you about the meters because I feel they so like much live... of that on your plane. Yeah. So, but but often, most of the time, I do not write from the drums. I write from some other um, melodic content, whether it's like I said, like a, a melody or a bass line, or or it could be a like the song um, on the song. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, um, Oh my God! No, I can't remember what it's called, and I'm gonna—it's gonna drive me crazy. The Neil Young song on my record, believe. <laughs> uh, you know, I call it Neil Young song, but it's um, um, uh, Bur Buffalo Bird Woman. Oh yeah. Like that—that that song, because I used to call it something else, and sometimes I think of the other title. But um, that song, like I was just—I I was messing around with the acoustic guitar, and I came up with this chord structure, and then um, and then I just wrote a melody to it. So. The process of writing to me, like I'm working on a, a new thing right now. Oh, really? And I've had this taking, you know, with my pedal board, I have a, a chaos pad, a little mini chaos pad. And sometimes yeah. when I come up with a cool loop, you can record in the chaos pad and it's the end of my chain. So I'll save like a like these loops in like weird lengths and then I'll have to chop it up. So yeah. I've had this idea of taking some of those saved loops and making some compositions out of them. So like right now I've taken this one loop that I've wanted to for a long time and I'm now that I know how to I'm learning how to really I should say I'm learning how to use pro tools like I'm starting to put together this one piece of music um and this I want to like I'm hoping to release a, like a record next year because it's going to take me a while to do this, you know, yeah. in this state of, of <laughs> yeah. music recording and playing because there's like i have two other song ideas and like one of them like the other two i just came up with the other day i was hanging out with some friends that were were in a pod with and the friend had a guitar and i was just messing around with her guitar and then i came up with this kind of chord thing and then um this other idea which is based on um this week durahim height who i played with years ago in china um and so like you know i'll have some kind of idea as like a, a foundation that i'll work off of mm -hmm. like that's generally how it works for me for writing and um yeah, it's not it, you, you know because it's not drummerish in a way if, mm -hmm. if you know what i mean i mean I it, it's a groove present but then, then you have like i don't know a ballad like on believe i think it's, that if only once i think mm -hmm. which is you know it's it's like a it's a ballad it's beautiful it's it's not drum dominating like you know sometimes you would imagine a drummer or although nowadays it's rare and rare but like you know it's basically about the song about the structure about the band and i, I like that about those tunes especially those two records it's so thank you beautifully arranged also you know like that seven four tune valentine with the two guitars going like, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's really nicely arranged and it's so cool, like what you did there. And I do, like I do when I'm writing for like that particular record, Believe, I knew that I was writing for um, two guitars and violin and bass. Yeah, I wanted to ask you that. Yeah, yeah. And I definitely think of those particular people. In fact, Jeff Parker wasn't supposed to, wasn't the guy that initially wanted on that record, but... Oh, really? I'm really, really, I can't even tell you how happy I, I am that 
that ended up the way it was because I've known Jeff since like 1987, 88. And, really? um, oh, wow. and I introduced Jeff and Nels together. And, um, and I had this idea when I was making that record to do use somebody else, but it was becoming too complicated. And then I called up Jeff and, and he was super into it. And he and Nels had met and jammed once. And, um, uh-huh. you know, that record sort of, I arrived at a place with that, with, that was my third record, believe, and um, like I wanted the record to be strings and percussion was how I sort of. I oh, really. Thought, you know. Oh wow! It really is. It's like you know, and yeah, uh, violin. Yeah, and yeah, it is basically strings and percussion. Yeah, you know. <laughs> of course. Um, yeah. And I love those timbres and those textures and and the way that the five of us play together was you know really really special to me. You know, yeah. like and and um, I mean I couldn't have been happier with how that record came came together and you know when you're working with people like jenny and jeff and nels and, yeah. and john like they will they are they would help you know put their thing into Us. it and yeah. as much as i would lead you know they would they would have certain ideas and and they're such strong personalities but they're yeah. all about the band you know yeah you guys actually sound like really like a band you know like it's it's together. I mean, but, but but that was like a working band also for some time. Like you, you guys did tour in that lineup and we did. We and, did a bunch of touring oh. and in quintet. Sometimes it'd be quartet, um, depending on people's schedules. Yeah. But oh, but yeah, I mean, I tried to get that band working as much as possible. And then we did some we did some gigs. Um, we did a we did play for a while because people were just way too busy and it was like impossible to book it. Yeah. You know, when yeah. you have a band of leaders, it's just like. I mean, That's John and I. Would, John and I, the bass player, would play a lot together because he he was around. And um, we'd do different things, but but um, but then I was able to do some more touring um, with that band right before you know John passed away, the bass player. Mm-hmm. And um, I was really glad that we got to put the time in that we did before we before he you know yeah yeah before that happened. Yeah. So yeah, um, no, it's it's a, it's a real cool lineup. I mean, that's r- r- real, you know. D- different it's it's different music it's it's kind of this different vibe you have like compositionally also which is a nice you know niche compositionally it's not it's not songs it's not jazz well it is but you, you know what i mean it's like <laughs> it's you which is perfect to that you Thanks, can man. capture this you know at least how i hear it i don't know uh, but i i just wanted to ask you some other thing about some other project that, which i didn't know that you did but then when i kind of you know listen back to some of records of yours, I found out this one, Fate to Orange, and yes. I, I, I was quite shocked. I mean, shocked, <laughs> sur- surprised, you know, that uh, I saw that, like, it, because you actually wrote all the arrangements for the orchestra and everything. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, how, how did you come up with the idea of doing that? It's kind of, almost like Steve Reichian in a way, but also like jazzy. And how did that happen, actually? Well. Um... A friend of mine called me up. The, the funny thing is, a friend of mine called me up to, because he was like, "Hey, there's this uh, this this um, commission offered by the Oakland East Bay Symphony, and they need they need people to be on the panel to judge this." And then I read about it, and I was like, "Hey, man, I don't want to be on the panel. I want to try to get this." <laughs> oh, wow. So, so just so so um so then I just submitted this idea, and the idea did involve Nels and Trevor. And the idea was, the initial idea was actually to have the orchestra improvise. Um, oh, okay. And, um, and, you know, but, but it was just, you know, when you're submitting something like that, you're just putting forth who you are. He's, you know, Michael Morgan, the conductor, yeah. was checking out people's music and stuff. And then when he chose the four of us um, to do, because there were four composers picked, he said, look, you can do whatever you want. I'm not holding you to this. So as I started writing, so so that's how I got the commission. Oh, you know, okay. so that's how it was. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and you know, just getting back to the whole idea of composing, like, um, for me, I love melody. You know, and yeah. um, often when I'm writing music, the drums are the last thing that I think about, and I'm just like, what the hell am I going to do on this thing? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I'll yeah. come up with something I'm like, what am I going to play, you know? Um, which is kind of a cool 
you know, a cool, challenging thing, yeah. you know, often. Sometimes I know exactly what I'm going to do, but but it's but I never really the the beauty about being a drummer composer for me is that I get to sit there and take all these voices, really great voices, and get them to do things. And <laughs> um, yeah. and what's really cool is that um, as the leader, you you know, the focus ends up being on the on the whole ensemble. And I think that that that, that that's kind of like sort of was a subconscious and maybe just just happened in terms of how I hear music. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so when this orchestral thing came along and I got it, I was like super nervous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because, yeah. you know, like, like one of the, the hardest part about it was whenever I write for my band, you know, or when you're writing for a group, small group of people you play with, you can write something. And it can be even a sketch and you get together yeah. and you can play it. But in this instant, there was none of that. And so I bought Sibelius thinking that once I wrote stuff, I'd put it in Sibelius and then I could hear it. But as I started writing, and um, we were assigned mentor composers. So this woman, um, Eleanor Armour, was my compos mentor composer. And I would get together with her and show her my ideas. And she she didn't really say much other than like, yeah, I think these are working. Um, I think, you know, this sounds cool. And then at one point, I think of third or fourth time together she's like look everything you've got everything here from what you're telling me what you want to do now you need to sort of like expand on these ideas a little bit mm -hmm. so my studio here was like covered in music paper like literally i wrote like 40 50 pages of music oh. but i only wrote five five staves of music you know and then um and then when i went to look into sibelius like what I realized was I'm, I'm kind of a visual person. So like looking at the computer screen and like thinking about the expansiveness of the orchestra, it didn't work for me. So I got some orchestra paper, right? Which okay. when you're looking at orchestra paper, you can sort of, I could sort of like visualize the whole orchestra. Yeah. And then, and then I just, um, I orchestrated the piece that way. And, Oh, oh. And I've been listening to a bunch of music. I've been listening to some Legacy and some Bartok, yeah. and and also like you know I, I love all kinds of music. And Peter Gabriel had put out that um, live, mm -hmm. the the new Blood Orchestra, mm -hmm. and um, and I was listening a lot to that record and thinking about, and then I read, I was reading the liner notes because you know here's a guy who's like a pop musician who I'm I'm a gigantic. I'm a I'm a huge fan of Peter Gabriel, man. Right. Like you, you know those two. Uh, sorry, like an intermezzo, but like you you know the, the quartet with Manu and Tony Levin and uh, uh, what's the name of the guitar player? David uh, Rhodes. Yeah, like you know when they have like that turning stage and Peter's on the they play Salisbury Hill and it's just like every time I, I watch that video like live every now and then because it just brings joy to you. All of them, you know, grooving and dancing. It's uh, anyway, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, uh, Peter's just like, there's so many things about him. I really hope I get to meet that guy sometime in my life. Oh, he's, yeah. he's just, you know, he's just as a musician and a person, you know, it seems yeah. like. Just, but he's someone who just, is, just does, there's no rules, you know. Yeah. But what he was saying in these liner notes was that when John Metcalf, who was writing the arrangements, would bring arrangements to him and he'd hear them, he'd be like, he wanted to make sure that the emotion came out. And like I was listening to Legacy's atmospheres, and mm -hmm. and as one thing that I was kind of curious about, and 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 some bar talk, and and some other things, and um, and you know, it's it's like music is a, for me is very emotional, and <clears throat> and um, and also the piece. It's kind of funny, but. I've written music. I've written little pieces of music for my kids, and and one day my wife was like, "Man, you haven't written me anything," so I didn't tell her. <laughs> so I didn't tell her, but I was like writing her the symphony, you know. Oh, wow. So so the piece was kind of for her, and I was like kind of thinking about her, and and also California and things yeah. and fade to orange. Her favorite color is orange, and also there's this oh. feeling. There's this feeling that when you're driving into San Francisco during the sunset over the goal, over the Bay Bridge, yeah. the color, of the, I'm actually colorblind, but the color of the sky, like is something that's always had this real big impact on me. And um, um, so there's all these things tied into writing this piece for me. Yeah. Um, and 
Um, you know, and also I realized, you know, I don't know if I'll ever get to write for an orchestra again, but I want to make sure that I don't put every last element of things I would do with an orchestra. Mm, yeah. You know, so I had to think, I was just, I really made myself think of it just like any other piece of music, like take this piece of music, really go with, run Develop with it, it. Yeah, and yeah. make sure that yeah. it's all working and seamless and, yeah. and, um, um, and then, so, so that was, so I wrote it over the course of like two years oh. when my daughter had been born and, you know, and I really had a lot of time to, to deal with it. So, um, cause when we were having, we had a press conference after we all got picked by Michael Morgan <laughs> and, and Michael's like, well, when do people want to go? And I just said, look, my wife, my wife was sitting there nine months pregnant. I'm like, I'm going to go last if that's okay with everybody. <laughs> so, um. So I had a lot of time to really work work it out, but you know, but I couldn't hear it. And then when I sent it to the copyist, the copyist sent me back um, Sibelius files, and I put it in the computer, and I could kind of listen to it. Oh, and wow. and and I was I was really happy. And then the first rehearsal. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. How, how was that when you first heard the oh, music? Man, it was incredible. It was just like I was just it was chills. I'm getting I get chills now. Just you know. Um, and the orchestra was amazing. They were all super nice, and they were all really into it. They, the performance was, well, the performance was amazing, and um, and it was almost like bittersweet because, like that was it. So then, over the course of the next three years, I literally took me three years to figure out how to record it, because you know when you're recording a piece like that. Um, there's all this little detail that I wanted to get in it. And, and I couldn't, I had to raise the money myself. You know, I didn't, yeah. um, I didn't want to. Um, so it took a long time to figure out the best process and then, and the people um, to help. I mean, I kind of knew some of the people I wanted, like the engineer and um, yeah. whatnot, but, but the, everybody between Eli Cruz, the engineer, Minna Choi, who, um, directs the Magic Magic Orchestra, and Che Che, um, che, che the conductor who works with um, with Mondo Kane, um, mm -hmm. like those three people, if, if it wasn't for them and the way they work together and their, and their passion and, and love for me and this piece, yeah. like it wouldn't have come out like the way it did. It was, yeah. um, so. You can imagine, it's a, it's a collaborative effort, yeah. 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 And, you know, and the players and just the yeah. way that it was in Trevor and, yeah. I mean, yeah. That, yeah, I, just, I wanted to ask you about that one because it's, it's quite a, a, a special, I think, project within your really huge discography, by the way. <laughs> like, but, uh, so, yeah, it, it's nice to hear the story behind it because, I, I, like, like I said, I was quite sur positively surprised, you know, I didn't expect that, you know, like mm -hmm. from, from you. But I, I wanted to ask you one other thing, like about discography now. Like I, I don't know, you've done like hundreds, two hundred albums. I don't know, like anyway. But like, uh, and now you've been a band leader for so many years. Like, what what do you prefer? Like, I know that's a stupid question in a way, no, but it's like, not a stupid question. Be, being a band leader or a sideman, of course, it depends on a sideman situation. But like in general, how would you compare these two? animals i mean they're very different you know you learn a lot if, if you're paying attention you learn a lot about being a band leader as a side person you know what i mean yeah and yeah. um and i remember when i first started a band and i was a band leader I remember i think i called up charlie hunter and i was like man i'm sorry for all the times i was a total asshole to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's that's nice <laughs> Because <laughs> Charlie was a Charlie, you know, we played together a lot, and 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 uh, you know, he's a he's a great band leader, and um, you know, like it's hard being a band leader. You have to yeah. you know, manage a lot of things, but you know, ultimately, um, it's it's so rewarding when you get to play your music. I mean, yeah. I think composing and hearing my music back, and in that situation, is the most rewarding thing in music for me. And especially when you're surrounded by people who have this respect for you and put their all into your music, you know, and, and, um, yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. but you know, being a sideman, I love being a sideman. I've learned like, you know, 
whether it was with Charlie or with Nels or with Madeline Peru or yeah, yeah, or know, Tony Furtado or, or it's Tony like, Furtado. yeah. But how how do you prepare for because your your you you know your spectrum is so diverse. Like, mm. how, how do you prepare like for each situation? Like, uh, I mean, it's still you always. Mm -hmm. But well, you know, Jim Campolago yeah. once said something to me. We were talking about. We were talking about like how it's hard to say no to people, but you know, like when there's something you feel like you don't fit and it's, and one thing that he said is like, well, if someone wants me to do something and I don't really want to do it, I just say, Hey, this isn't me. And, you know, and yeah, I mean, when you're young, you really try to conform to fit yeah. situations and, and make things work. But sometimes it's just, it doesn't work. And like, um, you know, what is that? I don't know how famous this is, but, I remember when Adrian Ballou made the record with Nine Inch Nails and then he went to rehearse and it was like oh, two yeah, days I later. Remember. I remember, I don't know, for some reason I saw this thing for two, day, two days later, he was he was home and he, he posted somewhere in a social media, didn't work, you know? <laughs> and it's like, it's like, you know, maybe recording worked, but just that whole other thing didn't work. And and um, when it works, it's amazing. And so, sometimes, you know, it takes a minute to get used yeah. to people. and But... I think the hardest thing for me at times has been when I'm in a situation and I'm being micromanaged to, mm -hmm. to the point where I feel like it's just, mm -hmm. but I'll say that then I'll say there's people that I've worked with who want really specific things who one could see as micromanaging, but the reason why they want things has more to do with you and what you bring to something than them trying to get you to do something to control that, yeah. that, you know what i mean yeah 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 those situations are amazing so i you know um it's it's just i think the hardest i think any i think the thing is when you're working with someone who's just kind of a jerk then that sucks you know yeah yeah sure i, I can but when you're yeah. when you're when you're working with people that are cool and been there <laughs> you know right yeah yeah you know and and even if even if you feel like you have a better idea or or like you know, maybe not a better idea but you you know i just hope I, i've i've produced a couple of records and the one the one of the first things i said to the people when i was working with them was like look everybody's idea is valid and we could sit and argue about ideas or we could play them because playing them is when we're going to really hear the truth and then yeah. we can talk about it That's so true. so like at least if if i'm in a situation and i have an idea and I feel like my voice can be heard, whether it works or not. I'll be the, I'll be a, you know, I'll be happily saying that shit didn't work, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, but then sometimes maybe you think something works and someone doesn't. But at least you get to try it. I think that's yeah. important, you yeah, know. Yeah, and that definitely. shows yeah, a certain yeah. respect, right? Yeah, definitely, I agree. Yeah, but, but but I mean, but I think the people you worked with are are probably so cool, you know, because the music sounds so cool. Like one of my favorite records of you is All Hat. With Bill. Oh man! You know, I, I'm like probably the world's biggest. Well, okay, hard to say, but one of the Bill Frizzell is like, you know, if there's a god, then next to it it's Bill Frizzell sitting <laughs> like like that, you know. And uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> and I just wanted to ask you, how, how was that experience? I mean, obviously you played with Jenny, and uh, but that band, you know, Victor Kraus, he's uh, the genius of bass of minimalism and. How did that project come together for you? Like, how, how how did you get involved into that one? Well, I met Bill years ago because uh, Bill's manager Lee Townsend, who's a really close friend, yeah. managed T.J. Kirk and um, oh, produced a whole bunch of records of Ch Charlie's and T.J. Kirk's. I didn't know that. So I, I've known I knew Bill for a long time, and then I did some play other playing with Bill when when the trio dissolved um, with Joey and Kermit. Kermit he did yeah. playing with different people and. It's funny, I was telling my wife about that. We were listening to the record um, Gone Like a Train the other day. Oh, yeah. Oh, my. She's That's like, so beautiful. This? Like, this is Bill. You know, yeah. and I was telling her about the record. After that, I think Good Dog, Happy Man. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Bill flew me up to, to Seattle to just workshop some of the music. Uh, and my really? wife's like, well, why didn't you play on the record? I'm like, because Jim Keltner played on Keltner, the record. Yeah. I'm like, like, don't worry. I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy with that. It's okay, wow. you know. That's still so Bill and, you know Bill and I would play together a bit and um, and then uh, Lee called me and said, "Hey, can you come up and 
do a couple of days in the studio for this film score. And I was like, man, of course. So, so, you know, we just went up there and, and the producers, I think were in the studio with us and Bill had all these ideas and we were just trying different things. And he's just, Bill's just a sweetheart yeah. and he's really mm -hmm. focused. And, um, he kind of, um, he doesn't often say a lot, but when he does say something, it's like, you know, really on point, you know, and, um, yeah. Um, and he's open to, you know, ideas and he's just, he's just such a cool guy, man. He's just like, he's really funny. And, um, but he, that guy just lives and breathes music. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like when you're around him, Seems like it's, it, yeah. it's kind of what you would imagine. It's just like music is, it's just oozing out of him. And, um, I mean, I feel grateful to have those times. There's a band that plays monk band that, that, you know, that I have with uh, Devin and, and Ben, we yeah. were playing, we were playing in Seattle and, and I called Bill and said, Hey Bill, you want to come and sit in with us? And he's like, and he happened to be in town. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he so, played those monk tunes with, with you guys or? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Wow. How was that? Man, it was amazing. And this, the bummer is the is sound re guy recorded? recorded it, but we can't, I have no idea where it is. Like, oh, I don't know, wow. I can't remember who the sound guy is. And, um, but what was really funny was we were having dinner and oh. um, <laughs> and Carol, his wife, came to dinner with us. And Carol's a sweetheart. And she's she's amazing. She's she's very talkative and very she's Italian. She's very expressive. Yeah. And we're sitting down and she goes, now, you better play Skippy tonight, because all I've been hearing for the last two weeks is fucking Skippy, 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 Skippy. <laughs> All he does is practice Skippy, listen to Skippy, practice Skippy, talks about Skippy. So you better fucking play Skippy. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> well, that's a, that's cool that you played Monk with him because he played it with Motion and Lovano, right? A lot. Oh, so, yeah. It was it was amazing. It was amazing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Bill's just like that. He's just he's you know he's a part of the community and he's like the star. I think that's what Zorn says. It's like. It's like he's he's too good for us, but he comes and he plays with us. You know what I mean? It's like yeah, yeah. He's but he's just. I love Bill, man. I just I was listening to. Uh, I mean, I have to say, probably my favorite record of all time is Power Tools. You oh, know? really? Oh yeah, I, I, yeah. I I love that one. Yeah. Uh, although I, I prefer much more the. I don't know the trio with Kermit. For me, it's like you know that life record from Life in Sevilla. You know the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's. That's an amazing record. But yeah, there's, but a the power tools the, also. Yeah. there's a thing about the Power Tools record to me that just a, achieves something musically that mm -hmm. never gets old for me. And it's, yeah. and, yeah. and um, I feel like Bill is really, and all three of those guys, there's just this symbiosis that is just, yeah. I don't know, really so good. unique. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really fun. I watched the other day on YouTube, you know, the bass desires, right? Mm -hmm. with, with Erskine and Johnson and it's so cool to see the, see that band, you know, because like, you know, their Schofield plays like you know the out stuff and fast pentatonic scales, and then you see Bill, he still has those '80s glasses, like the really huge ones, and then he starts a solo and just like, <laughs> and it's just like wow, you know, it's four notes within twelve seconds, but it's it's, you know, it's like wow, yeah, that's that's it, you know. Yeah. It's amazing what, what he does. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you, Scott, since, since you man, mentioned Ben Goldberg, uh, I, I wanted to, I didn't know that, that that record that you sent me, you guys who, that play Monk, I, I was quite surprised by it also. But I, I knew you played Monk with TJ Kirk, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I love how, how subtle that album with uh, uh, that you play Monk is. Uh, I really love it. It's different, but also I, I love the record you did. That subatomic, subatomic, subatomic. What is it? Particle. Oh yeah, yeah. Homesick on... blues. And I, I wanted to ask you, how did you hook up with Ben? I, I also watched the other day one footage with Myra Melford and uh, uh, the quartet. Of you oh guys. right, with, from the Freight and Salvage. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. with John Shiflett as well. And, and how did you hook up with Ben? When did you guys meet? Well, it's funny because um, Ben was one of the first people I met when I moved to San Francisco. Um, where there was a, you know, back in the 90s when there was a lot of live music, like kind of everywhere, there were a lot of jam sessions. And um, 
I went out to this, I think that's how I met him. I don't think I was, I don't think I was on the gig. I went to this jam session at a place called the Birdcage. Oh. And, um, um, <laughs> and Ben was there and we, I ended up playing quite a bit, I think that night. That's why I'm not sure if I was hired or if I just showed up because at the time when I first moved to the Bay, I, you know, I would just like looking for people to meet and I knew I had actually a bunch of numbers and I might've even had Ben's number cause I'd, I'd known Kenny Wallison. But, oh, yeah. um, so we went and we, and I played and we, so that's kind of where we met. And then, um, and then we just start, then I met John shot. Um, and then John and Ben oh, and yeah. I was they played, played the together. Yeah. And Trevor, um, yeah. and there were two. There were two bands. There was a band called, um, uh, oh man, what was the the two bands? Now I can't even remember the name of those two bands. Um, there was a band called Snorkel, which was John Shot, Ben Goldberg, and Trevor Dunn and myself. But oh, then, there was, wow. then there was a band called Junk Genius, which was. Oh yeah, I have the CD of that one. Yeah, yeah. And that's oh, with yeah. Kenny. That's that, with that Kenny, was, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we yeah. had these like two. This you know. The, the two different bands with two different drummers, you know, but so Ben and I just started playing together on and off over, you know, over the years and, and just, you know, um, he and Devin, the way plays monk came about was we used to play all these little gigs around town and, and we were talking, he's like, Hey, me and Devin have been getting together to play monk tunes. Uh, and he's like, do you, you want to play with us? I'm like, of course. So <laughs> we just got together and we started doing this. And then I got, there's a guy who was willing to put up a little money to make that record. And then uh, Fabrizio over at Long Song put it out. And, um, and then we tried to, you know, do a bunch of stuff with it. And, yeah. mm -hmm. and we recorded a bunch of other stuff. And, um, but, you know, Monk has been something that we've, the three of us have all just always upheld. I mean, from a compositional standpoint, like those yeah. tunes are... Yeah. Incredible, they still right? still stand after sixty years or even more sixty five. Yeah, yeah. And you know, we felt like it was you know clarinet, bass, and drums was a pretty unique take on it. So yeah, definitely, it's a, a nice. It's it's so spacious. Also, the the way you play brushes, you know, it's so different. Like you know, in the beginning, I found out about you from I don't know, you know, these records. I, I listened to them before. You know, all the Charlie's Hunters. All right, yeah, yeah. And you know it's groove, and then I heard you with brushes, and later with Bill and all that stuff. I was like, wow, that's you know it's different, <laughs> and I, I really like that. I didn't know that that story of you, and uh, so that that's quite cool. I, thanks for sending, by the way. That that oh record. man, so I loved it, enjoyed it. But uh, it's one bizarre thing I noticed the other day. I, I, I watched some footage. I mean. You, I, I saw first the solo stuff you did on drums for this lockdown festival thing, which. I, w I would like to ask you something, but th then I didn't know you, you did with this Mondo Kane project with uh, Mike Patton. And I'm a huge, you know, Fate No More fan. And I just wanted to ask you, how did you end up there? Like through Trevor somehow, or how, how was that? And how, how was it to play actually with him? Or how was oh, it? Well, playing with Patton is unbelievable. It's incredible. Um, yeah. But we met through, yeah, Trevor, you know, <clears throat> Back in the early 90s when I first met Trevor and we used to play together, Mike lived in this one part of the city where Bungle used to rehearse. Um, and he had this like sort of room in his house that was like a music space. So, yeah. and he was gone a lot. And he told the guys, just come over and you guys can play here. So, um, so one time we were over there rehearsing and messing around. I think Trey was even there. And, um, and Mike happened to be home. And we met. That was kind of the first time we met. And um, ah, so early. Well, wow. okay. Yeah. So, but he was always really busy, and we were always we'd kind of talk, and then he, you know, he would come out occasionally <laughs> to see us play different things, and um, and he kept sort of threatening me, threatening me, saying, "I have this Italian project you're going to play drums in one day." Oh wow! And, and I kept hearing about it for like ten years, and then um, and then he made the record, and then we were doing um. We were doing, Zorn was doing like a three nights at the Yoshi's in San Francisco and we did um, Cobra together. Oh, wow. And, and uh, we were like next to each wow, other, which amazing. was amazing because he didn't even have a monitor. And he's like, and, you know, that guy was unbelievable. So, um, so after the show, he's like, hey, look, there's this festival in San Francisco that wants me to do Mondo Kani. Um, are you available? And I was like, yeah. So. Ah, okay. So we did it in San Francisco, and it was the first time we'd really played together. Like we'd improvised together on and off, and Zorn did a um, Zorn did a um, a Masada in San Francisco once with Ben, 
Goldberg, Tre- Trevor. No, oh, actually, really? John, John Shiflet. Trevor was at, Trevor wasn't here. John Shiflet and um, um, John Shot and myself. Oh, and wow. at, at the end of the night, Mike came and sat in with us, and we did like a couple pieces. Oh. So, so other than those like little things, and just sort of seeing each other play, and like Bungle did this one really weird improvised night at this little club in in um in Oakland, and Ben and Will Bernard and myself opened up, and the place was packed, and we did this little trio thing, and then Bungle just was improvising, and by the time Bungle <laughs> set was over, half the people had left. Oh, they, wow. they weren't doing any Bungle tunes. It was kind of funny, but but um so so then we did that show in San Francisco, and it was Mike and I really connected. Like we just oh. felt nice. there was something. And I have to tell you, being on stage with him is like. You can't even explain it how amazing it is. He must be really a presence, right? Like, I mean, he's got a presence. He's got he's got a way of connecting with everybody in whether it's an arena or a field or whatever, yeah. and it's it's really like nothing I've ever experienced. Um, so then that band started doing some touring, you know, mostly South America and Australia. Oh, really? And we we have yeah we. You know, and we did in Italy. We've done some stuff in Italy, um, and we were supposed to be back in Italy last summer, oh, really? uh, which actually got canceled. But, um, but, but it's yeah. That project is you oh, know, yeah. what's so great about that music is that Mike really gets to, you know, flex all his vocal muscles on it. You know, yeah. and which and he loves that music, and that band has become a band also. You know, yeah. other that we have to we hire. Like they hire string sections yep. to play with us, but you know the core band is like thirteen people that are a bunch of ah. Italian folks, and it's like a family, you know. Wow, amazing! Yeah, it's it's really. I, I had to ask you, but I was, you know, I didn't expect. Again, it's like you're full of surprises all the time, like musically, and it's. Uh, I love that, you know, that you're like present on so many different things. Uh, uh, Scott, one, one question about collaborations. Just, I uh, probably you've answered this one like a zillion times, but like, you you know, wh- how did you meet with Charlie Hunter? You know, because uh, when I started with jazz, like you, you know that record, Ready Set Shango, uh, you know, with the Nirvana song on it and some other stuff. You know, when you start with when you're like 16 or something, it, it, that's like wow. You know, it's catchy and. Uh, then, then it's how I found out about you and all these other projects. And uh, how did you hook up with him? How, how did that story begin? And well, when I first moved to San Francisco in '92, um, uh, and I was playing around town a bunch. Like after about three months, I started kind of meeting people and going to jam sessions and playing. Um, I, Charlie was making a splash. Like Charlie was, you could saw his name everywhere. And I had a job. For a year and a half where i was delivering bread at six in the morning and i worked oh, wow. for the first like three and a half months i worked every day seven days a week wow. um and then it's so so and then I, and i would go to jam sessions and things but i wasn't like going out and i was going out to hear some music but and i wanted to go see charlie but it never like worked out to see him but i was playing a jam session this at uh, this club called uh the up and down club which is kind of became infamous at the time and Kenny Brooks was there saxophone player Mm -hmm. and Kenny and I exchanged numbers and Kenny was in alphabet soup and um and uh Jay Lane who played drums on the early Charlie records was in alphabet soup and Charlie's Uh trio so this one morning I can tell you it was July 3rd um 1993 oh well you actually know (laughs) it's just really funny how that date sticks in my mind one I had this my phone rings and it's Charlie and he's like, hey, man, this is Charlie. And I'm like, oh, hey, Charlie, you know, whatever. We're talking. And and he's like, look, I have a gig tonight. And my drummer double, double booked. And um, we don't really have time to rehearse if you can show up early. Um, but Kenny said great things about you and other people. And, and I was like, wow. I was like, I can totally do it. I had another gig book that night. Oh, and wow. I was just like, there is no way that I'm yeah. missing this gig. So I hung up with him and I called my dear friend Graham and I said, hey, man, like, I got to bail from my gig tonight. And he totally, he was very gracious. Yeah, I and I found him a drummer. And so I show up at the at the um, Paradise Lounge, which is this club. Back then, 11th Street 
um, was in San Francisco, there were like five clubs. Um, there was Slim's where Alphabet Soup was playing, and there was the Paradise, there was Club 11, there was the um, Oasis, and there was there was the DNA. Um, and, and in the Paradise, there were three stages, and it was just like, uh-huh. you know, music music central. So we, we played a little bit, rehearsed, and then we're playing the set, and when we're playing the set, the room is totally packed, and it's packed full of fans, but also musicians. And in fact, Jay, the drummer, who double booked, was there because the alphabet oh, suit no. was like on a break or something. So we immediately, musically, it was just like instant connection. Like, oh, wow. and, um, and I met like ten people that night. You know what I mean? I met Will Bernard. I met um, uh, this guy named Guitar Player Bruce. I met. Uh, man, I can't even remember just yeah. tons of people. I mean, and and from then on, it was just like whenever Jay would not be able to make a gig, Charlie would call me, and then he and I started playing duo. Duo, yeah. And um, and then Charlie called up me and John Shot and Will Bernard and started TJ Kirk, TJ which Kirk, was initially yeah. James T. Kirk. But ah, okay. yeah. And TJ but, Kirk became quite quite like especially. I mean, may, maybe not in Europe. I mean, I followed followed it because you know, like when you're like a geek music then you search everything like but in the usa or especially in the west coast that it was quite a big group right yeah it was it was you know it was a thing we we had we were getting a lot of attention we were locally playing all the time and then we started touring i mean warner brothers didn't exactly put enough behind it um we did we did like a tour of the whole country and it was it was a little rough you know um and charlie and i were on the road a lot at the time so um but but we got nominated for a Grammy and we were shocked for our second oh, really? Grammy. I didn't know that. Wow. Totally shocked. Um, we didn't win, but we, me and Will Bernard went to the Grammys. Actually, I think John went also. I can't remember. But, um, but uh, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was a thing, uh, you know, it became, and we did a reunion in 2003 and put out a live record. Yeah, we, the the yeah. last tour we did, like we recorded this live stuff that I really, really was kind of, for years bugging the guys like, man, this is some great shit. We got to put it out. And then finally we put it out and, um, you know, maybe we'll do it again. Yeah, yeah. It's a special, it's kind of a special group of people. Chapter. Yeah. And your musical, but, uh, man, I have to ask you just one question because I found it really interesting that, uh, why did you move to the West coast? I know it sounds like very plain and simple, but no, it's not. I, it's a good question. I mean, you know, you were, I mean, I would like to ask you about New York, like a little. But first, like, why did you go to the West Coast since you were kind of in the mecca of jazz, let's say, mm-hmm. on the east? Well, I went to school in Boston, you know, and yeah. I grew up. I grew up right outside of New York City, and I used to go to New York a lot to hear <laughs> music. And my plan was to go to Berkeley, College of Music, after go to New York, and like try to be the next Steve Gadd. That was my plan. <laughs> you oh, know? Wow. But, um, man, so much happened between the end of high school and through college that musically, um, by the time I was finished with school, and then I, I did move back to New Jersey for six months before moving to California. I had oh. moved, I, I'd visited San Francisco and was like the, about, about eight months, before, 10 months before I moved. I visited San Francisco because a girlfriend at the time wanted to move there. And I was like, this place is incredible. But I had also met um, Larry Grenadier and uh, Kenny Wallison because they spent a, co- a couple months in Boston one summer. And they told me a lot about it. But um, when I moved to New York or New Jersey, like, and I was playing a bunch in New York after um, school, like there was something about it that, I wasn't feeling and I having visited California and, you know, I was like 22. This was like what? The the early nineties or like late eighties kind of. This was 92. 92. Okay. Well, yeah, I visited, I visited the summer of 91 and, and my feeling was, you know, if I go to California now and I don't like it, I'll just move back. Yeah. You know, cause like, but there was something about the Bay Area and something about being somewhere totally different. And, I, you know, I, was just, I listened to this interview Jeff Parker did about six or eight months ago and or whatever. And he was like, you know, 
not don't take this the wrong way, but I didn't want to sound like a New York musician. And no, it's funny no, no, no. Yeah. because I thought about that. And after he said that recently, and I was thinking, you know, I guess I wanted to go somewhere where I could sort of explore. I felt like I could explore more and not have to be one thing, not like one thing, but I knew what New York was about because I grew up yeah. there and, and it was amazing. There were amazing musicians, incredible music. And I loved it, but something was just like pulling me in a different direction. And, and, you know, back then it's like, there was, again, there was like, San Francisco was full of live music. There were mm -hmm. like, I did a bunch of research and, and there was a lot happening. And, um, but it was funny because, you know, there had been the earthquake in 89, there was a drought, yeah. you know, there were fires in the hills and there was a recession. I remember my dad's like, you're moving there. I'm like, <laughs> Yep. You know, cool, so I had a little bit of money in my pocket and, um, and uh, I found a place and I met some cool people. And then, you know, I mean, the funny thing is back then I started working because there was all kinds of work and, you know, yeah. like not like stuff to write home about, but, you know, I just, there were gigs, you know, there's yeah. us, us musicians could just play gigs and make 50, hundred bucks, 150 yeah. bucks and casuals and, so yeah. you could, you know, so, yeah. so that's kind of what brought me there. And, and I kind of never, I mean, over the years, you know, people left and moved to New York or LA and, and I'd sort of go back to New York to play sometimes. And I'd be like, all right, can I move here? Can I live here? And I just, it just never pulled me back, you know, and I love going there and I love all the people there. I just, it, it just, um, and then I met my wife and, you know, I have yeah. family now, but, um, but it's also um, the, the quality of living in a way, right? It's, I mean, yeah. New York, like the many times I've been there, it's like really, you know, it's this constant cramp in a way. It's amazing. I mean, I, I love it. But I guess in San Francisco, it's a little bit more yeah, mellow it's in a way. It's total yeah. West Coast, yeah. you know. It's like people say to me, like, you can bring the jersey out when you need to, but you're so West Coast now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I um, yeah, it's, it is a different pace and it's it's a different landscape and you know it's been rough lately with the fires the last few yeah. years and and the, some of the things that we love about california are shifting and changing and you know with with climate change but um but when it's but but my wife and i we really it's just there's nothing like it like we yeah. just my son and i recently started surfing and like oh wow that's nice which is incredible you know yeah. also ass kicking but really fun yeah. you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but um but uh and the landscape has changed in terms of the work you know um yeah. but because i've been here so long and i know people and i'm doing you know i'm able to do a lot of home yeah, recordings yeah um but uh, you know i'm also different because i'm older and i have different sort of feelings about things so yeah but um no yeah, yeah. No, yeah no, I, I just wanted to, to, like just to go back to when you were younger <laughs> just uh, you know I, I, I just wanted to ask you like let's say in the early 80s when you were a teenager and uh, you remember some of the gigs you saw like in new york like you probably saw so many incredible concerts you you, you remember some drum i don't know did you see like alvin or tony williams or stuff like that play that or you remember some stuff that kind of mesmerized you or well i used to go to the clubs i could get into were um mckell's which is the club on 96th and broadway um i could get into Pretty much any club. I used to go a lot to um, the the fifty five bar and see my oh, yeah. Stern playing different people. Oh, yeah. You know, I'd see like Adam Nussbaum. Um, God, what other drummers would play with him? I mean, I saw like you know Ben Peraski play when he was younger. I saw oh, yeah. JoJo Meyer play with with him once. You know, when really, JoJo oh wow, yeah. yeah. Um, I saw um, um, uh, God. I mean, I used to go to McKell's and hear like. Hiram Bullock with uh, different people, and um, I saw. Um, I used to see Michelle Camilo play a lot with Dave Weckl. Really, you know, oh, wow. Joe Rosenblatt, and I'd go to. But I also would go like to a club called uh, Man. What was it called? There's a club on Fifth Avenue, and you know, like Jocko would be playing, and um, oh yeah, uh, would be playing, and um, um, but I'd go to like uh, I knew the owner of the bottom line because they he was in lived in our town and his kid was a, a musician also and um he would get us in um, um even though he wasn't supposed to let us in he would let us in we'd buy tickets and stuff but 
So you like, saw Jocko play also and stuff. I like saw that? Jocko once. Oh, I saw wow. like you know, but I'd see like like one time I was I was seeing Steps Ahead play and Steve Smith was playing, oh. and as I'm sitting there, this guy sits next to me, and I turn and it's Omar Hakim. <laughs> How cool! So like you know, I, I was like at one point I leaned over. I was like, man, that should be you up there. <laughs> Just laughed, but um, um. <laughs> And then I'd go like to then I'd go to like to the Beacon Theater and see Pat Metheny or Jack DeJanet and or Wayne Shorter or um you know, I saw Sting's first band at Radio City Music Hall, you know. Oh, yeah. But I'd I'd see Pat a lot. Well probably the, the 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 concert that had the biggest impact on me was when I saw the Song X concert with DeJanet and Charlie Hayden or oh, yeah. that, 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 that 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 record is amazing, yeah. Yeah. That night, the music that I heard was so mind blowing. That was kind of one of those moments where, like, something hit me in terms of the possibilities of music, and um, and that you know just sort of yeah. changed me. And I had some. I grew up with some friends, some some kids that like listened to a lot of cool music. I was just talking to this bass player friend of mine, Jeff Allen, who's a few years older than me, and we used, I used to go to his house and he'd play me. Like records, or he'd play me like Steve Kahn records with uh, ah, Steve yeah. Jordan, you know, yeah, yeah. which oh, yeah. I love. I love records, Steve Jordan, you know? yeah, me too. Yeah. You know, and and all all like Weather Report, and we'd go to concerts together, and we'd play together, and um, there were some cool radio shows back then. But yeah. yeah, I would. The thing about New York in the in the eighties was it was really easy to get into every club except the Blue Note. Yeah, you could not. They they were super uptight. In fact, we had met. The guys in the Yellow Jackets were doing a did like a, a workshop at the studio, and they were super nice. Me and my friend ended up talking to Russell Ferrante for a while, and he's like, well, "Look, I'll put you on the guest list." And he tried, but he couldn't. Really? You know, we he couldn't let we couldn't get in, and it was we were super bummed. But um, um, yeah, really, but I mean, yeah, I feel like yeah. really lucky to have like, you know, um, yeah, Mikel's was great because like Art Blakey played there a lot, and um. Like I saw Lost Tribe, Ben Prowski's band. You oh, know. I love Lost Tribe, man. That's like one of the most underrated bands ever with Adam and Vinny and all these cats. Oh, you I know, love that like song. it was cool. Just they're they're um, or seeing uh, like Dr. Lonnie Smith with uh, Robin Ford and and George Benson came and sat in. You know, really? Oh, and, wow. um, and I knew George because I knew his kids. Um, I went to sleep with his kids, and and the thing is, here I am at this club I'm not supposed to be in, and George walks in, <laughs> and and I, I see him, and he looks at me, he's like, "Hey, how you doing?" I'm like, and Adam is like, "Hey, Mr. Benson." <laughs> how cool, <laughs> man! That's funny. beautiful. But uh, man, but hearing him and Lonnie together was amazing, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it beautiful, was, man. Yeah, amazing. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about that because I've read that you you know you you lived on the East Coast, and it, it's. You know, I love hearing these stories about how, how people got in the beginning. You know, like th there's always a record or something that you see, and it's like, damn, this is this is what hits you. You know, I, I like the first time uh, what got me into jazz was like I heard "The Road to You" by Pat Metheny Group, that 1992 record. Mm -hmm. I just my guitar professor gave me like a CD, and I was like, yeah, I'll, I, I made made a copy of on the cassette, then uh, and I went to play basketball. Then I came home, okay, I'll listen to it then. And I was just like, oh, you know, so at that moments like that, you know, like you described now also, that's, it's nice to hear musicians like you tell these, uh, yeah, these stories. Yeah, I, love yeah. so, yeah. I mean, I'm really lucky I got to play with Pat and I got to sort of thank him what, for... Wow, with Pat Matini? Yeah, I, yeah, I saw San Antonio for a couple of gigs in Hawaii. This was, um, this was a few years ago, yeah. Um, with the group or like trio or... With um, the quartet he has now with Linda O oh and Gwilym Simcock. Really? Oh, yeah. How's that like? Oh, it was incredible, man. It was, Pat is, Pat is like incredible. That guy is probably the most articulate musician I've ever played with in terms of really knows what he wants and really knows how to, how to get you to think a certain way and, and really listen deeply. And, and he's just, you know, and he's just, it's, it was incredible, you know. I learned so much. I mean, there was a lot. I actually had to learn a ton of music. I mean, we ended up only playing like half of it. But, but, um, but and the way it came about was Antonio, when he was getting his green card, um, 
you had you know you have to go to the, to an, to have an interview yeah. and they just like tell you and you just have to go so he was on tour with pat and um this was four years ago and um and antonio called me up and said hey man i gotta do this thing and i might not make a gig so pat said i need to get get it covered are you available and i was like yeah so <laughs> so me and antonio got together and i met pat, and i never met which i met all heroes at festivals and pat's one i never met and so it was amazing and he and i like got together and rehearsed for a few hours and uh, told he told me stories and yeah. i mean it and it was and then antonio was able to make the gig um the first time which which you know was fine and but pat's like i really hope we get to play together sometime because you know he you know i really did i really worked hard you know yeah. to make it to make it work and then a year later his manager wrote me and he's like hey there are these gigs in hawaii that antonio can't do and pat will do them at the end of the tour if you can and i was like i can totally do them <laughs> so um so then you know i rehearsed i practiced this music and and then we get to hawaii and everything's cool and we literally had 10 minutes to rehearse before the gig wow. it was it was incredible and and it was so fun and yeah. and it was great man it was just like you know, to play with him, one of my heroes, and yeah, just, yeah it was incredible, you know. Yeah. And he's so nice and just like, um, you know, that music is so iconic, some of it. Because yeah. he was playing a lot of older music, you know. and Yeah, I know. I saw that quartet in Italy live with uh, Antonio. And it's basically the old repertoire, you know, the the group and his old stuff. And it's it's always for me so nostalgic to hear those tunes because I grew up with them in a way, you know. So. Right, right. Yeah, it's so nice that you got to do that, man. Yeah, yeah. Doctor Jazz. Doctor Jazz. 